We live in a stressful world. There are worries about wars, elections, and pandemics. On a personal level, there are worries about jobs, children, marriages, and money. In fact, the American Medical Association has estimated that as many as 70% of all patients visiting their general practice physicians do so with symptoms related in some way to unrelieved stress. But God has a better way for us to live, a burden-free way. Here is how Jesus put it. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest on your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, Jesus offers us a burden-free way to live. Isn't that good news? Some people have the idea that God wants them, way down with guilt and fears and uncertainty. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden light. He wants to take your worries away from you. As the apostle Peter said, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. There are three easy steps to take to enjoy burden-free living as revealed in Jesus' words in the Gospel of Matthew. Step one, come to him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Not come to drugs or alcohol, or to some sin, or to empty relationships and pursuits, or even to our own strength, but come to him. And he promises, I will give you rest. What do you need rest from today? Psychiatrist Thomas Holmes and Richard Ross' famous stress scale lists life most stressful events. At the top of the list is the death of a spouse. Number two is divorce. Other items on the list include losing a job, illness, moving debt. What do you need rest from today? Guilt from sin. Jesus has forgiveness for you. Is it fear concerning a problem too big for you? Jesus has unlimited power for you. Do you have difficult decisions to make? Jesus has wisdom for you. Step one for burden-free living is to simply come to Jesus. Come to him and come to him daily and he will give you rest. Step two, follow his plan for. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. Take his yoke upon you, not your own not someone else's. The yoke in Jesus' day was the wooden cross piece put around the neck of an ox to pull a wagon. As a carpenter, before he entered his ministry, Jesus would have made these for customers. And he says that the yokes he designed were, were easy and light. So many of our burdens are self-inflicted. We step out of the way Jesus wants us to live, and before you know it, we have a mess on our hands Someone has wisely said, an ounce of obedience is worth a pound of prayer. Not all troubles can be avoided, of course, but many do come from disobeying his plain commands. We step out of his will and end up with a mess we have to do a lot of frantic praying about. What decision are you facing? Be careful. To choose God's plan to take Jesus' yoke, it will lead to the burden-free life he wants you to have. And so to recap our steps for burden-free living, come to him daily. Step one, follow his plan for your life. Step two and step three for burden-free living is to leave the results up to him for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A pastor in New York City, when counseling people about turning their lives over to Jesus, would take them to the RCA building on Fifth Avenue. In the entrance was a gigantic statue of Atlas holding the world on his shoulders, all his muscles straining, barely able to stand under the load. The pastor would say, now that's one way to live, trying to carry the world on your shoulders. Then he would take them across the street to St. Patrick's Cathedral to a shrine. Behind the altar where the boy Jesus, eight or nine years old, is holding the whole world in one hand, with absolutely no effort at all. That the pastor would say is the other way to live, 
letting Jesus carry your burdens for you. That's the privilege you and I have every day to cast our anxieties on the Lord and let Him carry them for us. In other words, after you come to Him, after you choose His way, then simply leave the results up to Him. He, He'll take care of the burden for you. You can trust Him to work it out. This is the way Jesus lived when He was on earth, trusting His Heavenly Father to take care of the details for Him. Think about it. The salvation of the whole world depended on Jesus, and He followed His Father's plan. The salvation of the whole world depended on His Word being spread. But He never once wrote anything down, nor did He ever say to His apostles, Is anyone taking notes here? This is important. The salvation of the whole world. Jesus' journey through the world depended on the formation and spread of His church. But He called a bunch of fishermen and outcasts to get this job done for Him not CEOs or generals or politicians or marketing experts. But you know what? Jesus didn't stress any of this. He left the results in the Father's hands. And you know what? It all got written down. The disciples got the job done. And His Word and Church have spread all over the world. Leave the results of your life up to the Father as well. The prayers you've prayed, the questions you have, even the mistakes you've made, he can handle it all. Don't let yourself be weighed down with worries and anxieties. That's not God's plan for His children. Enjoy the burden-free life Jesus offers. Come to Him. Follow His plan for your life. Leave the results up to Him. One thing that my mother would say to me all throughout young adulthood was, Son, leave, leave it to God. She would often say that about every single problem I shared with her, She'd ask, have you prayed about it? Have you looked in God's word concerning it? If I said yes, her answer would be, well, leave it to God. And if you think about it, how many of us try to carry our own burdens when Jesus wants to be our burden bearer? How many of us want to take our problems, our issues and struggles and try to fix them without so much as prayer offered to the Lord for guidance, for wisdom, or intervention. Leave it to God. What is in your life that you need to take to the cross and trust Jesus concerning it? What is it that you need to leave in God's hands? When I think of leaving my burdens in the hands of God, the story of the sheep star Shunammite woman comes to mind in 2 Kings. 4 verse 8 to 37 we're told that the Shunammite woman was a kind and generous woman who lived in the town of Shunam. One day she noticed the prophet Elisha passing through her town, recognizing him as a man of God. She invited him to her home for a meal, impressed by her hospitality. Elisha wanted to bless her. In return, he promised her that she would have a son within a year, despite her and her husband's old age, true to Elisha's word. The woman gave birth to a son the following year. However, tragedy struck when the boy suddenly fell ill and died. The devastated woman took her son's lifeless body and placed him on Elisha's bed in their home. She immediately set out to find Elisha for help. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Kings 4 verse 2526. After her son had died, the Bible reads, So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, Isaiah's servant, look, there's the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, Is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, All is well. This woman maintained that all is well, even after the unthinkable happened. Upon seeing the woman, Elisha sensed her distress and sent his servant Ghazi with his staff to lay it on the boy's face. However, the woman insisted on accompanying. Um, God, we, we're going to get buried at the God of the desert. There's a lot of history to cover there. We're going to get buried at the place where the eggs live. Inside the eggs, there's a little man and a little woman uh, who walk around. And they take care of them. 
and they 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 feel a lot of dignity and they show that they feel like they they have to be taken care of they're being treated like they they have to do a lot of things with them which is her actions led to unexpected blessings in her life elisha's prayers and faith in god resulted in the miraculous restoration of the woman's son this reminds us of the power of prayer and the importance of seeking God's intervention in our lives. But perhaps the most powerful lessons were taught in her story are the power of trusting in God's promises and the value of taking our burdens to God. Despite her and her husband's old age, the Shunammite woman believed in the promise given by the prophet Elisha. She teaches us the importance of having faith in God's word even when circumstances seem impossible. And then when tragedy struck, the Shunammite woman immediately sought out Elisha for help. She wasn't seeking Elisha, but rather the God who Elisha served. This teaches us the significance of bringing our problems and concerns to God, knowing that he is able to provide solutions and comfort in times of need. So I encourage you today, whatever situation you find yourself in, take it to the Lord in prayer and leave it there. In closing, let me remind you that the Bible says in Psalm 55 verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Have you ever had one of those days where it's just a fight where everything is a fight? Your journey to work seems like it's a struggle. You get to work and it's hostile that day. You go home and something unexpected happens. You get an unexpected letter or an unexpected bill. Then next thing you know, there's an unexpected argument with your husband or wife. I mean, have you ever had a day where, where everything is a struggle? Everything is just a fight. You try to read the word, but that becomes a fight. You try to pray, but that proves to be a fight too. You put some worship music on, but you find that you're still fighting. So in this case, what do you do? Well, I believe that when it appears to be impossible, when life is at its darkest, this is when you should call out to the Lord. David experienced days like this quite often. He must have because all throughout the Psalms, there's this theme of calling out to the Lord. I mean, think about it. How many times do we read something along the lines of in my distress? I called upon the Lord to my God. I cry for help. Or you might read something like here. O oh Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me today, dear listener. I want to encourage you to call on the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 5 verses 1 through 12, listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you. I pray in the morning, Lord. You hear my voice in the morning. I lay my request before you and wait expectantly, for you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness with you. Evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful you, Lord, detest. But I, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence, I bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with malice. Their throat is an open grave with their tongues. They tell lies, declare them guilty. O oh God, let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all people who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them. That those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. Saints of God, there is a name that holds power. There is a name that chases away demonic spirits. There's a name that brings light in the midst of darkness and that name is Jesus Christ. I believe that the Lord wants us to stop worrying, to stop pondering 
and wondering about what might happen tomorrow. Stop spending your effort and your energy thinking about what could happen, could happen tomorrow, or even what should happen. You are blessed in this very moment. And on this day, one pastor said, don't borrow trouble. And that means don't worry about all the what ifs that we could face someday. What if there is a health crisis, a financial setback, or, or even some unimaginable type of problem? Don't borrow trouble for the future, but instead walk by faith and not by sight. So I encourage you today to stay present with the Lord. Stay present in your mind and in your soul. Do that by acknowledging something. Psalm 118 verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. But when we let worry and anxiety consume us, it stops being adaptive. It becomes destructive. It becomes enslaving. Instead of focusing on God, we focus on all the things that could possibly go wrong. Things that we usually have no control over. But there's someone who is in control. Our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Understand that. The God who made the heavens and the earth is the same God who is watching over us right now. He is intimately involved in every situation. He is infinitely good and infinitely wise. He sees everything that could possibly happen. He sees our worries and yet he commands us not to fear. He commands us instead to trust him. He knows what's best for us even more than we do. And he knows that in the end, Satan will be defeated. Love will conquer all. And the forces of darkness will be no more seen no matter what's going on in our lives. God is in control no matter what's going on in the world. God is in control, and whether you understand it or not, God is in control. Nothing is a surprise to him. Nothing catches him off guard. God sees the entire timeline of the earth from beginning to the end. God is in control. I love the verse in Psalms 37. It says, I have been young and now I am old. Yet, I have not seen the righteous forsaken. That's what I call a faith verse. It's one that's meant to strengthen your faith. It's meant to encourage you to keep the faith when we're struggling. It can be easy to think that God has abandoned us. After all, he has the power to deliver us with just one word. He could make all our pain go away in an instant. And yet, this is not typically the way that God chooses to work sometimes. He allows us to go through deep waters before providing a way out. But that doesn't mean he doesn't love us. That doesn't mean he has forsaken us. It simply means he has a better plan, even if we don't understand it. One of the biggest enemies you will ever face will come in the form of worry and anxiety. And in life, I'm sure we can all agree that there will be some things that are in your control that you'll worry about. There will be things that are out of your control that you will worry about. And while it's so easy to fall into a state of worry and one of his teachings, Jesus gave us the message that we should not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. And I believe that the Lord was telling us to be present in the moment, to be at peace today, to be joyful today. If you spend all your time and energy worrying, then you will always magnify the lack in your life or the pain in your life. Worry is all to do with if, if I can't pay this, if I don't get treated, if they find something, but instead you should choose to adopt a new attitude where you do not worry about tomorrow. An attitude where you're thanking the Lord for today. You're thanking God for his goodness even while you're waiting on your miracle. You're thanking God for what he has provided even though there are things that you lack. When you do this, then you magnify Jesus Christ instead of magnifying your problem. Matthew 6, verses 25 through 27, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? 
and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? The Bible also says in Matthew 6 verse 34, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. A believer in faith will pray and say, God stand with me in this storm I'm facing. A believer with worry will pray and say, God, what if this storm destroys me? What if it never ends? How come you're not stopping this? But for the person who wants to live their life in the way God intended, you have to decide. You have to make a choice. How will you handle worry? At one point or another, you will face something that will make you worry. It is wonderful that we are told to cast all your cares on Jesus. Everything that bothers you, cast it to the Lord. Everything that worries or concerns you, cast it all to Jesus because he cares for you with the deepest affection and he watches over you very carefully. The word of God says in 1 Peter 5 verses 7 through 9, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful your adversary. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Do you ever feel like your life is falling apart? Maybe you lost your job or going through a breakup and it feels like God has abandoned you when you need him the most, no matter what you're dealing with or how bad it is. I can promise you that God is still with you He's always by your side, and he will never leave you. In the book of Ruth, Naomi lost everything. Her husband died, her sons died, and she encouraged her daughters-in-law to start over with new husbands. But God didn't leave Naomi on her own. When she planned to return to her hometown of Bethlehem, Orpah said a tearful goodbye and left her. But Ruth remained. Naomi told her to follow Orpah, but Ruth said, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And so Ruth accompanied Naomi to Bethlehem. Naomi was in a bad place when they arrived. The town was surprised to see her return, and she told them to call her Mara, which means bitter. She said, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. When Naomi left, she had her whole life ahead of her. She had her husband by her side, and she looked forward to seeing her children marry and have children of their own. But she didn't return to Bethlehem as a grandmother. She returned as a widow. It's hard to imagine the kind of pain she must have been in if you haven't experienced it yourself. But needless to say, her pain was incredible. It's never easy for parents to outlive their children and for spouses to live on alone. Naomi had Ruth with her, but still must have felt alone and far from God. She must have wondered why God was allowing her to go through so much pain and suffering. But God had a plan for Naomi. He encouraged Ruth to remain by her side and he led Ruth to the field of Boaz to collect leftover grain. Boaz looked out for Ruth and when she returned home, she told Naomi about him. Naomi was encouraged by this news because Boaz was one of their guardian redeemers who was responsible for taking care of the family when no one else could. When Naomi decided it was time for Ruth to move on and find her own home, she told her to approach Boaz and tell him that he was her guardian redeemer. Ruth did so and Boaz was willing to help. He was not the closest relative, however, so he first had to make sure that that man did not want to be her guardian redeemer. When he didn't, Boaz was free to buy the land and claim Ruth as his wife. When Ruth eventually gave birth to a son, the women of Bethlehem told Naomi, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. 
May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. These words emphasize how the Lord continued to care for Naomi even after she lost everything. God put it in Ruth's heart to remain by Naomi's side, and he led her to Boaz who, through Naomi, married Ruth and cared for Naomi. When Naomi lost her family, she thought that she had lost any way to be provided for, but God was always looking out for her. He ensured that Ruth was able to get grain and be kept safe in the fields until she married Boaz, and he took care of them both. He gave Ruth the courage and loyalty to remain with Naomi and love her as much as her family did. Ruth remained a part of Naomi's family even after their connection was no longer technically there. Naomi may have lost the life she had in Moab, but she gained a new life when she returned to Bethlehem. My friends, God can do the same thing for you. No matter how much suffering you've gone through or will go through, the Lord will always remain by your side. The way He provides for you will look different for each person, but He will provide nonetheless. Like Naomi, He may use someone close to you to encourage you and help you begin a new life. He may lead you in an entirely new direction and reveal to you a better plan than the one you had in mind. He may speak to you through His Word to remind you of His love and presence in your life. However God decides to provide for us, we must be open and willing to receive His provision. This means that we have to trust Him and maintain our relationship with Him. One of the most important components in our relationship with God is prayer. God doesn't simply allow us to pray to Him, He asks us to. He wants us to take all of our struggles to Him so that He can hold them for us. Even though He already knows what's going on in our lives, He wants us to tell Him what happens and how we feel about it just like we would tell anyone else. He wants us to admit that we need His help and to ask for it. As Paul writes to the Philippians, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God wants us to bring our fears and anxieties to Him to ask for His help and ask Him for His provision. When we do this, God will claim our hearts and reassure our souls. When you bring your trials before God, He will give you the strength to face them. Another great way to maintain your relationship with God is to surround yourself with fellow believers. It's important to become part of a church community so that you have fellow Christians who can look out for you and pray with and for you. If you bring your problems to a non-believer, they won't give you the same kind of sound advice that a Christian would. A Christian will hear your problems and pray with you. They'll encourage you in your faith and walk beside you. They'll remind you that the Lord is on your side and that He can do all things. If you don't have any Christian friends to turn to, you'll miss out on these important reminders and will be more susceptible to losing faith and feeling like God has abandoned you. It's also very important to study and familiarize yourself with Scripture. When your life seems to be falling apart, you can remind yourself of Naomi's story and all of the wonderful provisions and promises the Lord has provided in the Scriptures. If you're feeling low, you can simply recite one of the many verses describing the love God has for His people, such as 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, which says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Simply meditating on God's Word can do wonders for your soul. God will lead you to the passages He wants to speak to you through but you have to be willing to open your Bible and let Him lead you. You must open your heart to whatever He has to say and truly listen to His words. But none of this will mean anything if you don't fully dedicate yourself to the Lord. You must put away your old self and put on your new self who is reborn in Christ. You must accept Jesus' sacrifice as the atonement for your sins and live your life for the Lord rather than for yourself. 
It doesn't matter how much you pray or read the Bible if your heart isn't fully dedicated to the Lord. God wants all of you just as he gives us all of him. This means that when things get tough, we have to remain with the Lord as much as he remains with us. He will never abandon us and we must never abandon him. He promises to get us through every trial as long as we trust him to do so. If we do this, we will receive an everlasting reward. James 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. This is one of my favorite verses to turn to when things get tough. It's a wonderful reminder that this life is not all there is. We may struggle for a time here on earth, but that struggle isn't forever. God will get us through our trials on earth and we can look forward to our reward in heaven. We will receive everlasting life with God where there will be no trials or temptations. We'll be surrounded by God's love and live a perfect life. Sometimes we look at people's earthly lives and wonder how they got to be so lucky. Maybe they have a really nice home or a nice car or just don't seem to have very many struggles in life. But no matter how great their earthly life might seem, if they don't have God, their eternal life will be pure misery. They may have a few good years on earth, but they will spend eternity with Satan in the fires of hell. But Christians can remain confident no matter how difficult life gets because we know that greater things are in store for us. And in the meantime, God is always with us. Are you in a desperate situation, constantly fighting off doubts, fears, insecurities, and everything the devil throws at you? This word of encouragement is coming directly to you to remind you that you are not alone. What you are going through is not because you are bad or because God hates you. It's only a test that will soon come to an end. And do you know the wonderful thing about tests? Once you pass a test, you are rewarded. See what the Bible says in James chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Apart from the breakthrough and deliverance coming, you get a reward for holding on, for trusting God, for not giving up on Him. You are rewarded for keeping your faith intact despite the storm and the devil's attempt to take you away from the faith. God's system of testing is to ascertain whether you can be trusted with great things. Look at Abraham. God tested him many times. He had to wait long, hard years before he saw the promise God made to him fulfilled. Do you know how hard it is to wait for a year, let alone 25 years? But Abraham waited for the promise. He believed God knowing that God was not a man that he should lie. He knew that God would do what he promised. Bring that home to yourself. Do you also believe in God? Do you have resolute faith in your heart that God cannot lie and he will surely bring to pass everything he has promised you? The sad answer is that most believers have not gotten to this point of unbending assurance in God. They panic when they sense a delay. Their hearts go haywire and they start seeking other alternatives immediately when they don't see the promise fulfilled in their own time. Don't forget that the promise is from God. So the method of bringing it to fulfillment and the timing will also be His. What you need to do as a child of God is to keep trusting Him, holding on to His word with absolute faith. Because as sure as the heavens are above the earth and as sure as night gives way to day, his word will be fulfilled. After Abraham received Isaac, one might think he had overcome all tests and would not be tested again. But no, it was a greater promise God wanted to bring him to. So he needed to pass a greater test. Just as you have to pass an exam to move to the next class, get a promotion or climb higher in your career. Your faith also needs to be tested before you step into greater realms of glory. When your faith is tested, you pass the test. 
you can then move on to another level of glory that may also come with a higher test. That's how you continue to progress until you finally move on to heaven to receive the greater reward. God knew that Abraham loved Isaac. So he said, sacrifice your son, your only son whom you love. This is where most people would struggle and start questioning God's love for them. They may say, how can you ask me to sacrifice the son I waited for 25 years to receive? But Abraham needed to go through that test as well before God could entrust him with the blessing of the word and make him a channel of blessing to the whole world. God wanted Abraham's heart to be fully devoted to him and not divided among worldly things. Similarly, you might also be going through a test to ensure that your loyalty lies solely with God. Your friend whom you trust so much might have betrayed you and God might be asking you to forgive and reconcile with them. As painful as that is, it is a test. And if you fail to obey it, you might be surprised at how things will unfold in your life. Is your child terribly sick? Fighting for their life, you may have prayed, trusted, and believed, but their condition worsens. This is when the devil will bring various suggestions to you. And it is a time when you might start asking God questions that you shouldn't be asking him. But do you know that it is just a test? Of course you love your child, but God loves them far more than you do. You want the best for your child, but God will undoubtedly do what is best for them beyond what you could ever do. So you need to surrender to God, let go and allow him to step into the situation. When you completely depend on God and allow him to have his way, you will enjoy the coming breakthrough. Returning to the story of Abraham, did you know that while Abraham obeyed God and was ready to sacrifice Isaac, he somehow believed that God would raise him back to life. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 19 states, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. That is faith which you need to face in the unknown future. You don't know what tomorrow holds you. The current situation may make tomorrow seem dark and gloomy. But instead of allowing the devil to fill you with fear, face the future with faith. Put your trust in the never failing word of God. Hold on to every promise he has made for you and be assured that God will never fail to fulfill all he has promised. There is no mountain before you that God does not know about. And the mountain is not there to subdue you. Rather, you are meant to speak to that mountain in faith and it will melt away your faith in God allows you to partake in every blessing he has promised. But once you lose that faith, you put yourself at great risk. Once you give in to fear, anxiety, and other negative emotions, you open up to the devil's attacks. Whatever you are going through at the moment, always find comfort in God's word, knowing that it will pass away. And when it does, you will have a greater reward for your patience and endurance. Your faith is tested to make it stronger. With every test you overcome, you become stronger and more worthy to carry the glory of God. It is always darkest before dawn. So when you feel it's becoming unbearable and you just want to quit, that's when you need to hold on to faith even more because your victory is right at the door, of course. The period when your faith is being tested will not be fun and exciting. It will be hard, painful, and daunting. But you don't have to rely on your strength. You don't have to trust in your own abilities to see you through because your strength will fail you. Instead, you can draw strength from God. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint when you rest in God, acknowledging that you do not have the strength on your own and that you can't make it without his help. That total dependence on him is what will bring the promises in this verse to fulfillment in your life. You will mount up with wings like an eagle run and not grow weary 
and walk and not faint. Only when you place your hope in God. Now, when you know your faith will be tested and that only those who endure to the end will be saved, what do you do? The Bible says, if you faint in the days of adversity, your strength is small. That means when you give up during trying times, your faith is not strong or mature enough. That is why you need to make your faith a growing and active faith. One that continues to increase to match the levels of challenges you face daily. So that in the days of adversity, your faith will not be too small to carry you through. How do you then build your faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's the key. There are no two ways about it. While you can pray for God to increase your faith, he won't do it in a vacuum. Your heart must be filled with something that will help boost your faith consistently. And that something is the word of God. When you hide God's word in your heart, it becomes your support when the going gets tough. It becomes your reference point. When you can't see a way out of your situation, it becomes your source of strength. When all other strength fails, that is why you need to invest in this aspect of your life. Before the word becomes spirit and life to you, you must first find time to read and meditate on it. When you cultivate the habit of reading and meditating on God's word, you are building your faith. As your faith grows, it becomes easier for you to withstand the test of time. Believe God's word and act based on your assurance in his word. Whether you are under attack, going through a test of faith, or enjoying the best in life, you need to keep your faith strong. The small things you do daily contribute to the overall strength of your faith. When you constantly meditate on the problems, your present predicament and reports from various sources, these are the things that can send your heart into panic. And you might even start giving in to suggestions. Instead of focusing on what is wrong and allowing it to keep you down in sorrow and gloominess, meditate on God's word. He delve into his promise for you. Plant them in your heart. Recite them as many times as you can until the words become alive and active within you. By doing so, even through the darkest times of life, you will continue to see the light through God's promises. Beloved, it is your responsibility to hold on to faith no matter what happens and to believe that it is faith that will consistently bring you victory, regardless of what you face, no matter how dark or uncertain is the situation. It is just a phase. It will pass. And not only will it pass, it will make way for the greatest things God has prepared for you. So keep building up your faith by continually meditating on God's promise going through life could be likened to sailing on the sea. Sometimes you sail peacefully, and at other times you hit the storms. These storms have different effects on our lives. Sometimes they come to destroy your finances, jeopardize your health, steal the peace in your home, and many more damages. Many of us are going through this storm season right now, and if you are one, the Lord is here to encourage you this morning. Believers need to know that life's challenges are not peculiar to the Christian race. Those without Christ also will not be so sincere enough to tell you when they are suffering. This is why the Word of God says that we should not envy the unrighteous when they prosper in their way. Dear child of God, you do not need to feel offended by God just because things are difficult now. You need to know that if you were outside of Christ, things would not have been any better. That voice that tells you that if you withdraw from God, things might get better is the voice of the master of all lives. There is no iota of truth in that statement. When the storm hit the sea while Jesus and his disciples were on the boat, there was a great possibility that other fishermen were in their boats somewhere on that same sea. Do you think that because the enemy has nothing on the fishers, they will not experience the storm even though they were on the sea? I doubt it because troubles are inevitable in or outside of Christ. Life's troubles are no respecter of any man. However, when you are in Christ Jesus, your case is different because you are more than a conqueror. 
God has promised never to leave you. Therefore, irrespective of the severity of the tribulations in your life, God is with you. Psalm 124, 2, 5 says, If the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared against us. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. These verses are to encourage you in the Lord your God. They're specific words of hope for you this season. You're standing because He is with you. You may have been pressed on all sides, but you are not crushed because God is with you. If only He let you see what the enemy has planned for you, you would better understand the battles He is fighting on your behalf. It may be hard to believe He is with you when things go sour and everyone else has deserted you. You may be unable to feel His presence, but you must believe that even when you cannot see the Lord, He is there with you. There is no wind too terrifying enough to scare the Lord away from your side. You may have lost a fortune, your businesses are failing, and your relationships aren't going well. It's okay to feel like your world is crumbling, but God is here to remind you that you are never alone. When you are tired of walking, He will take you in His hands and pilot you. Jesus, your Lord and Savior, experienced many storms while He was on earth. There was a time where there was no food to feed the multitudes that had come to listen to His teachings. What else could be so humiliating to a notable figure? There was a time where he had to leave his mother and brothers behind to do the work of his father. And finally, there was a time when he experienced a physical storm that threatened his life with those of his disciples. What kept him through all the unpleasant situations he experienced is that he never doubted that God was with him. This belief was what helped him to walk against all odds and do the extraordinary. Beloved, do you believe that God is with you? Knowing your stance is important because even though God will never leave you alone, your faith in Him is what helps you to keep a hold on Him. If you are unsure of God's presence with you, then the enemy can capitalize on that to make you feel God has deserted you. If you do not believe the truth that is available to you, the enemy will sell his lies to you. One of such lies, if God was with you, you would not be experiencing so much difficulty. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Do you realize that when God speaks about you walking through the fire, waters, or rivers, He did not say if, but when? It is certain that you will have bad days, unfavorable seasons, and life-threatening challenges. They will come. No one can escape such days. Nevertheless, He says, I will be with you. That is God's word to you. It does not matter the depth of the river. It does not matter how fierce the fire is. God is with you. Take him by his word, beloved. The scripture says that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he a son of man that he should repent. God would have been called a liar if you had to go through life without experiencing any form of struggle. You may be asking, why does God have to let me go through all of these? If God genuinely loves me, why does he allow such things to happen to me? It is okay to ask such questions, especially if they are directed to God. He will answer you if you ask Him. You know, God is not hiding the reason for your tribulation from you. If you desire to know, He will reveal it to you. The truth is that God has to make some difficult decisions sometimes. The fact that He loves you is not disposable nonetheless. If he does not allow some of these tough times to come your way, he will be hampering your spiritual growth. God will be denying you some privileges by not allowing you to be tempted and tried. It is through these experiences that you grow. It is through them that you learn how to always trust in him. And it is through them that virtue is being worked out in you. If you were never allowed to experience disunity and disagreement in your home, you might never know that God can restore peace to your home. 
You may not even know how to manage your emotions and genuinely forgive those who offend you. Just like in the case of the disciples, if there were never a storm that night, they would never have known that even the wind obeys Jesus. You need to begin to see beyond the causes of your struggles. You need to see beyond the physical manifestations as well. What you should be focusing on is the voice of the Lord. If God is with you, then it means that if your troubles destroy you, God will also get destroyed in the process, which is practically impossible. Nothing can destroy or outwit God, not even the biggest storm or delay on earth. He is the Almighty God. He is the one who is walking you through. You may seem too small for the challenges, but remember that they did not just come at you. They have come at Jesus as well. Trust in him and know peace. It is possible to experience peace amidst the storms of life. This will become your testimony if only you will trust in the one whom you serve. I'm not talking about a kind of faith that wavers and makes you a double-minded man. I'm talking about the kind of trust the three Hebrew boys had in God. They knew that God was able to save them from the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar. But even if God chose not to, they were not ready to compromise. Possibly this was the point that God wanted them to come to. That made him allow the king to bring about the golden image and the fiery furnace. In your case, there is something God wants you to have that you do not have yet. You do not know that he, the Lord your God, can deliver. Perhaps you have heard or read about how he delivered others but never experienced it. Those you read about have gone through theirs. They have learned about God in new dimensions, and they have grown in their trust in Him. It is time for you to learn about God and grow your faith in Him. It may not be easy, but do not believe Satan's lies over God's truth. God will never leave you. He will be the fourth man in your fire. He will be there to shut the lion's mouth, and He will be there to command the wind, saying, Peace, be still. Whatever you are going through is not outside the knowledge of God. He is the all-knowing God. It was a difficult decision for him to make by allowing his children to experience challenges, but he allowed it because it is for your good. God may allow what will break you to come your way, but he will never allow what will destroy you to come your way. You may go through what will bring you the lowest points of your life, but if God is with you, he can catapult you back to where you have always been and beyond. At the end of it all, you will be made and not marred. Child of God, rejoice. Rejoice because your boat is safe, your life may be threatened, but let it be known to you today that every threat against your life that is not from God is empty. So long as God has your life in his hands, nothing can permeate his hands and get to you without his notice you are in safe hands. The storm may rage and the winds may blow stronger and stronger, but God has not lost control. He never will. Therefore, rejoice in the hope that even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is there to walk you through safely. Jesus said in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Beloved, in all these things you are more than a conqueror. The king is on your side, you can never lose to the enemy. If you flip to a random page in the middle of a book, you aren't going to have a clue what's going on. If you start the book from the beginning, by the time you reach the middle, you'll have some idea of where the story is headed, but you still won't have the full picture. It isn't until you have reached the very end of the story that you can fit all the pieces together and see the big picture. It's the same with our lives. While we are living our lives, we can't know exactly where they are headed. We don't know what God has in store for us, but God is the author of our stories. So he knows exactly what is going to happen to us at all times. He sees the bigger picture and we have to trust in him to guide us towards it. When we deal with trials and tragedies, we often ask God why he would allow us to go through such pain. Sometimes we even allow our sorrow to separate us from God. 
We may become angry or bitter or turn away from God instead of toward Him. When we do that, we are forgetting that God has a reason for everything and that He works all things together for His good. God knows better than we do, and we have to trust Him. Of course, this isn't always easy. Nobody knows suffering quite like Job, but he presents a wonderful example of trusting in the Lord in the midst of sorrow. When we read the book of Job, we are given more information than Job ever had. The book opens with the meeting between the Lord and Satan. God references Job as a wonderful example of a godly man, but Satan challenges the Lord by saying that Job worships him. Well, he is blessed and protected, but if he were to lose all that he had, he would turn away from God. The Lord responds, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. When we read the rest of the book, you have to keep in mind that Job knows nothing of this meeting. He has no idea that the Lord is using him as an example of a godly and upright man. Job is in the middle of a story, and he has no idea how it's going to end. Over the course of time, everything that Job holds dear is taken away from him. He loses all of his livestock, followed by his sons and daughters. When he hears this news, Job says, the Lord gave and the Lord is taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. But little does Job know that his suffering has only just begun. In the second chapter, we read of another meeting between Job and Satan, where God upholds Job as a righteous man. This time, Satan claims that if Job himself is harmed, he would no longer praise the Lord so. The Lord gives Satan permission to strike Job's flesh on the condition that he doesn't kill him. Job is then inflicted with painful sores from the base of his feet to the crown of his head, but when his wife encourages him to curse God, Job replies, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Despite all of his pain and suffering, Job still refuses to turn away from the Lord. We are always more than happy to accept blessings from the Lord. Yet we have a hard time facing trials, but our lives on earth are full of ups and downs. We cannot live perfect lives because sin entered the world and we have been corrupted by it. We must learn to not only be thankful for the blessings, but to remain loyal to God. Throughout the trials near the end of the book of Job, God speaks to his servant and emphasizes his great power over all things. When Job hears this, he says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job recognizes that God is in control of all things, including his life. God knows the purpose of each of his servants and, and his will will be done whether we like it or not. But while this may sound scary, it really isn't. We should be encouraged by the fact that God is control and that he will lead us wherever he wants us to go. And in the end, we will be rewarded for following him. Job received an earthly reward for enduring his suffering without turning away from God. God restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. You and I are not guaranteed an earthly reward like the one Job received but we are guaranteed something much better. Eternal life in heaven with God. This reward has only been made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, which is part of the Lord's big picture for all earthly time. The Lord doesn't just know what is going to happen a few hours from now, a few days from now, or even a few years from now. He knows what is going to happen from the beginning time all the way until the end. And we can see evidence of this knowledge throughout the Bible. The Old Testament is full of hints and prophecies of the Messiah. Jesus did not arrive until many years later, but his death has been foreshadowed since the beginning of time. In Genesis 22, God commands Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. As the ultimate test of his loyalty, this command foreshadowed God's sacrifice of his only son on the cross in the New Testament. But while God spared Isaac's life, he could not do the same with his own son. He sacrificed Jesus on the cross so that we could be made blameless in his sight and receive eternal life in heaven. 
In Numbers 21, while Moses was leading the Israelites through the wilderness, he began to complain against God. They accused Moses and the Lord of bringing them away from Egypt to die. So the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and anyone who was bitten died. The Israelites turned to Moses and admitted that they had sinned against God. They pleaded with Moses to ask God to save them. God then instructed Moses to make a bronze snake and place it on a pole somewhere in the camp, where everyone could see it. He told the people that anyone who was bitten by a snake would be saved. If they looked up at the bronze snake, the story is told in only a few verses, yet it is full of symbolism and foreshadowing. The bronze snake represented Jesus on the cross. In the same way that the Israelites who looked upon the snake would live, those of us who look upon Jesus on the cross will be granted eternal life. As Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Even though the Israelite story takes place many years before Jesus' arrival on earth, the bronze snake shows us that God had a plan all along. He always knew that Jesus would come to earth and die on the cross to save sinners. Even before the Israelites reached the promised land, and this isn't the only example of foreshadowing of Jesus coming. David is considered one of the most righteous characters of the Old Testament, and he is often compared to Jesus. In fact, Jesus is referred to as the son of David. David's life closely mirrors that of Jesus. He is considered a type of Christ like Jesus. David was born to humble beginnings. He was the youngest son of a shepherd, yet he became the king of Israel. Jesus was born in a manger, yet he is the king of kings. David endured many difficulties throughout his life, but he remained faithful to the Lord. He had many of the attributes that Christ is known for, such as patience, mercy, righteousness, and loving kindness. He was even born in Bethlehem, where Mary would give birth to Jesus many years later. But while David represents Christ in the Old Testament, there's one very big difference between the two. Jesus is the perfect Son of God, while David was not. David was righteous, but he sinned. He did not live a perfect and blameless life. But Jesus did. And because of that, Jesus was able to accomplish what no one else ever could. He was able to save us from our sins. Jesus' birth was even predicted in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where Isaiah writes, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. This verse is repeated in the story of Jesus' birth in Matthew 1, which says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. We can clearly see from these verses that the Lord knew all along that Jesus would come to earth to save his people. God had a plan all along and nothing could thwart it. He gave hints to his people of what was to come, but only God saw the bigger picture of salvation. Only God knew when and how he would deliver his people to salvation. From their sins, God sees the bigger picture not only in your life, but for the whole world. He is aware of the entire timeline of the universe from beginning to end. We never have to doubt that God knows what he is doing in our lives because he sees everything. He knows exactly where we fit into his plan. Even when we don't, we have to be like Job and trust in the Lord's plan, no matter how painful it may be for us. Whatever you are going through, remember that it is happening for a reason. God has already written your story from beginning to end, and you can trust him to navigate you through it. We need to hold on to the Lord and remember how much he loves us. He loves us so much that he sacrificed his only son on the cross to save us from our sins. Jesus freely offered his life so that we could receive salvation through him. From the moment he was born, Jesus knew that he had been sent to die 
and he lived a perfect life and willingly went to the cross because that's how much he loves us. We don't need to be afraid of where our lives are headed because God has already written our ending and we can trust him. Truth be told life does get hard sometimes for every one of us. Different struggles show up daily in our lives. We struggle with family challenges, finances, mean employers, job loss, exam failures, etc. Others happen on the inside, such as mental health disorders, depression, sorrow, and loneliness. We fail so hard that we begin to wonder what the point of life is, if it is all just a miserable existence. What is the point? Point of these struggles if we are going to die in the end. I mean, most of us have gotten to a point where we don't see the value of life. To make it even worse, these are not easy times. We experience days of looming sadness, despair, and hopelessness. Things that steal our joy and make us feel alienated from the world around us. Events that wipe the smile from our faces. In situations and days, we can't even feel the presence and love of God in our lives. During these times, God seems like a distant idea or some fictional being who doesn't care about us answer our prayers or at least keep us from getting into bad situations. We feel angry, betrayed, or hurt by his refusal to act while our lives are falling apart. Does he see? Does he hear our cries? Does he ever care? The truth is God does hear our cries. He sees our tears. He listens and answers our prayers. And even more, he fights our battles. Whatever the challenge we face, be it physical, emotional, or mental, we must never forget that God fights for us, always. The Bible says that he is our protector. He never slumbers nor sleeps, but watches over us. He doesn't let his eyes close, even for a microsecond. He's always keeping you safe. You must realize that in the desperation that comes along with hard times, the enemy will try all he can to feed you lies. He will tell you that God doesn't love you, and that is why he lets you into the mess you are in. He will tell you that God doesn't listen to you, and that is why your prayers have gone unanswered for a long time. He will tell you that if God cared about you, he'd have shown up for you already. That is what the enemy does. He tries to use every opportunity to shake your faith in the Lord. He is always on the lookout, waiting for you to expose your vulnerable points so he can attack. We must know that this enemy is greater than the problem itself. He's more than what we can see. Someone who has wronged us, our struggles and weaknesses, and the negative thoughts we fight daily. Because he is the mastermind behind our challenges, he masks himself as a financial problem, an illness relationship struggles or misunderstandings between you and your spouse disguised as a problem. He tries to make you forget your identity in Christ, fall victim to his trick, and fall off your salvation. This is how he works, and as a believer standing firm in your faith in Christ, you can be assured that this will keep happening. Challenges and problems will always be present in your life. This is not to indicate that God is not there, but that whatever you're doing is disturbing the kingdom of darkness. Your firm stance on the truth of the gospel is not settling well with the enemy, and that is why he will do anything to make you backslide. As a believer who is living like salt and light in a dark world, you are a nuisance to the prince of darkness. And because of this, you won't go for long. Without encountering obstacles and attacks, he'll hurl in your direction. However, we have this hope in God our Father that he is always with us. In every situation we find ourselves, in every circumstance, every dark scenario or dark hole that life's difficulties have thrown us. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus and his promise that he will always be there with us. Our God is greater than any battle we face. He fights for us, always giving us the victory that Christ has already won for us on the cross. If you're in the heat of the battle right now, or if the enemy is hot on your trail, please know that you're not alone. Never. 
Neither are you left to fight on your own. God is with you, fighting for you. He has given us this great assurance in Isaiah 41. 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 43. 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. It may seem like God is so far away, or that he has abandoned or forsaken you. But that will never be the case, child. God is always with you. He is not blind to your tears, neither is he deaf to your cries. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Isaiah 59, 1. God is right there in the middle of your troubles, worry, sorrow, or depression. He doesn't just sit and watch as you battle the enemy alone. He fights for you. The Bible has so many stories that we can read and feel encouraged in the Lord. When the Israelites were rescued from Egypt through Moses, they came up to the shores of the Red Sea, and behind them the Egyptian horses were in hot pursuit. They felt trapped and hopeless, crying out to Moses and blaming him for bringing them into the wilderness where they die. This is the message that the Lord gave to Moses to pass to the people. Do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Lord will fight for you, and you need only to be still. Exodus 14, 1 3, 14, when David was going to fight the Philistine giant Goliath, who was advantaged in both physical stature and weaponry, this is what he said to him. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Amen. The God of the armies of Israel is whom you have defied, 1 Samuel 17, 45. And in verse 47, the Bible says, For the battle is the Lord's. King Jehoshaphat was a good king of Judah, whom the Bible says was devoted to the ways of the Lord. 2 Chronicles 20 tells the story of three vast armies who descended on Jehoshaphat with intentions to go to war. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord, verses 3 through 4. He led his people in prayer and worship to the Lord, and in his fear of the armies and looming war, he confessed that he didn't know what to do. But our eyes are on you, such a beautiful expression of trust and faith in God. God answered Jehoshaphat through a prophet telling him, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army for the battle is not yours, but God's. Verse 15, when we face battles, it is normal to feel afraid or scared that our enemy will overpower us and destroy us. We might even doubt the presence of the Lord in our lives or his active intervention in the struggles we face. However, we must never forget that the Lord is always on our side. With him, we are not just trying our luck or fighting with slim odds of winning. We are assured of his active and loving presence in our lives, even on the days when we can't feel his power divinely moving in us. We should trust that he is working behind the scenes, fighting battles that we know and others that we do not. He never leaves us to fight on our own. He is always there, constantly working on our behalf, shielding, protecting, strengthening, exposing deeds of darkness, covering us from the cruel attacks we face. Even when we're unaware, in the mysterious detours that our lives may take as the Lord works in our lives, sometimes we may not understand what is happening. However, even during those times, we can trust in the assurance that God has the best plan for us and that he is working daily to actualize that plan. His will for us is good and perfect, so we can entirely place our hope in him. The enemy might attack us from all sides, but he will never win. Victory will always be the Lord's and ours as his sons and daughters. 
If we pray for wisdom of the Lord and the power to discern the schemes of the evil one and ways to avoid them, he, the enemy, will have no control over us. May the Lord help us as the salt and light of the world to remain steadfast in him and unyielding to sin. That is the calling we have been given as believers in Christ. Even in the midst of tragedies, pain due to different reasons, loss and devastation, the Lord promises to give us peace and to be our pillar of strength when we feel weak. When the world treats us unfairly, wrongly, or persecutes, we have a fair judge in the high heavens who will bring us justice. We should not be afraid, but turn to him with all that trouble us. No weapon formed that is formed against you will prosper. Isaiah 5, 4, 17. That is our heritage in the Lord, our inherited blessing, possession, and gift. Straight from his hand, no matter what comes your way, you have been called to live a life of boldness and trust in our Father in heaven. He is with you wherever you are, no matter how dark it gets and how slim your chances of survival appear to be. You've got to trust that the Lord is with you. He is working a way out for you. You do not have to see the way, but you only need to have faith. Absolutely trust in our God. He has never lied, not even once. And so when he says he will deliver you out of that hard phase of your life, he will. He sees your pain. He knows how hard you are trying. He knows how deep you have fallen into that pit, but he is getting you out. The Lord will bring you the victory you so much desire. But in the meantime, just hold on and keep your hope on him. Have you been through a challenging situation and wondered why you had to go through it? You're not the only one. Many people wonder why hardships exist. Why does God allow us to go through trials, tests, sorrows, or heartbreak? Where is he when bad things are happening? Why does he not intervene? These are questions I used to ask myself. I know many are asking the same questions I used to ask. While I don't have all the answers over the years, I've grown in wisdom and insight and understand better why God operates the way he does. Today, I want to help us understand why the testing of our faith is important and what it means for us believers. Let's first unpack the difference between tests and temptations. Tests are allowed by God so that we may come to know how trustworthy and faithful he is. God permits tests for the exercise of our faith, the same way we exercise our bodies to grow stronger. It may be hard to understand, but tests are for our good. The Apostle James says in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. During tests, we learn that His grace is truly sufficient for us. We learn to rely on Him and trust in Him. Temptations, on the other hand, are from the devil, and His intentions are always evil. They are one of the enemy's tragedies to entice us to sin and cause us to stray from the love of God. While passing tests results in good, yielding to temptation leads us to destruction. Like the liar he is, the devil hides temptations behind tests. Often we encounter temptations while going through a test of our faith. Satan is a ruthless adversary who will tempt us during the test to make us fail. Here's a perfect example. Led by the Holy Spirit, Jesus went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days and nights. At the end of his fast, the devil came to tempt him. He wanted Jesus to fail the test and tempted him when he was most vulnerable at the end of the fast when he was hungry. Three times Satan tempted Jesus and three times Jesus overcame the temptations. Jesus overcame the temptations by standing on God's word. The scriptures, the same weapon, the word of God used to defeat the enemy is available for us to use today. If Jesus used scriptures to defeat the devil, we should also use them.
Let's look at how you as a believer can successfully navigate through tests and trials and come out victorious during tests. Do not despair, but remember that God is with you. He is watching you and cheering you on. God wants you to know that you're not alone. He's with you to walk through the difficult times and to give you victory. God is saying to you in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You can rely on God and experience His faithfulness. His grace is sufficient for you. When you are weak, He is strong. Whatever it is, stay the course until you overcome it. Win. You're a winner and a conqueror through Him who strengthens you. In addition, tests and trials open your eyes to His power, love, grace, mercy, and kindness. During the testing of our faith, never forget that your pain is not in vain. It has a purpose. It's not meant to crush you, but to establish you in the Lord. We can see this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. The testing of your faith is not meaningless. There is a purpose. The result is not devastation, frustration, hurt, or disappointment. God has something he wants to do with you, for you, and through you. At the end of the test, he restores you and establishes you. There is a restoration of your joy and happiness. He gives you a renewed passion for him and the kingdom. He enables you to be happy and to rejoice in Christ again. At the end of the trial, you will receive growth, insight, and knowledge. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says, For a little while you may have had to suffer in grief in various trials, so that the authenticity of your faith, more precious than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You may not understand how all you're going through will work out for your good, but you can trust Jesus. You can trust that all things work for the good of those who love him. You are one of those who love him. During testing periods, keep calm and remember his love for you. Picture a dad watching his child in a race, smiling and urging the child to keep pressing on and not to quit. Like the supportive dad, God is cheering you on speaking words of encouragement and strengthening you when you're weak and he does it out of love and kindness to us god tests our faith not because he doesn't know but because he wants us to know too he provides a way for us to measure our faith by his grace god wants us to know how much we can trust him how much we can depend on him for strength during hard times lastly faith is like a muscle the more we use it, the stronger it gets. It doesn't wear out with use, but increases as we go through different situations and apply our faith. We increase our trust in God. In the book of James, we read that faith without action is dead. During tests, God gives us opportunities to put our faith to work. Once we have gone through the process and have allowed patience and endurance to have full play, we'll be spiritually mature, lacking nothing. When we seek him from our little faith, he proves faithful. When we rely on him to get us through our weak moments, he proves to be our strength through daily reliance on him. Our faith begins and continues to grow. So what should you do when your faith is being tested through the furnace of affliction? Hold on to God. Don't let go of your faith in God, no matter how bad the situation is. Let God add to your cup of faith by remaining steadfast and grounded in Him. Pray to Him to help your unbelief to expand your capacity to trust Him. Ask Him to open your heart to greater wisdom and knowledge to bring His super to your natural. Ask Him to fill in the gaps in your faith so that through Him you can stand and accomplish what in your own strength you could not. 
Remember this when God allows us to go through trials, he uses the circumstances to draw us closer to him. Through the testing, our character is molded into Christ's likeness. You can rejoice in God through the tests. Like Job, you too can say, but he knows the way that I take when he has tested me. I will come forth as gold in a nutshell. Being tested is simply a part of the process of becoming more like Christ. He wants us to succeed. The more we lean into him, the more grace he can pour onto us. God allows us to be tested because he loves us dearly and wants us to grow in grace and the knowledge of him. Trials show that our faith is genuine. When our faith remains strong through many trials, it will result in much praise, glory, and honor at the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus.